So first of all, uh, my name is Philip. I'm a medical student here in Brazil and also the former president of the Brazilian Department of Academic Leagues in Cardiovascular Surgery. And uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight in our meeting about the training in cardiovascular surgery. Uh, I would like to thank the Brazilian Society of Cardiovascular Surgery to host this meeting and also Medit and Sandra to promote the event. Um, I would like to thank especially our foreigner guests that due to different time zones, we are really far apart. But uh, uh, my special thanks go to Professor Gaurav Ailavadi from the United States, Professor Rafael Sabada from Spain, Professor Francisco Maizano from Switzerland, Professor Henrique Mura from Brazil, and Professor Rui Siqueira from Portugal. And also my special thank you to Professor Rui Almeida who invited me to host this meeting tonight. Uh, as Professor Rui already told us, unfortunately, the Professor Tone Nguyen couldn't join us tonight. He's, he's attending a COVID meeting right now, so maybe he will join us later. So tonight we hope to exchange experience from all around the world to improve our surgeons, uh, especially the surgeons of tomorrow, uh, as myself and other uh, medical students that are here tonight. We will have, we have already have some questions that we sent to our speakers and we'll start talking about uh, our medical formation and uh, then our, the, the, the path in medical, the path in cardiovascular surgery training as a resident. And after that, we'll talk about the career as a surgeon, a cardiac surgeon in the beginning. So we'll try to address these questions to different speakers so we can learn a little bit from each of you. If you want to answer a question that was uh, asked to another speaker, that's okay. If you want to show us PowerPoint slides or graphics or pictures, that's also fine. You just need to uh, share your screen. And uh, I hope we can all learn a lot from you. And once again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Dr. Professor Rui Almeida will introduce all of you again. So, Professor? Let's start with uh, Professor Gaurav Zavadi. He's a professor of surgery at the University of Virginia and the chief section of adult cardiac surgery at the University of Virginia. Rafael Sadaba is associated clinical professor of the University of Navarra and the uh, European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery Council member and a cardiovascular surgeon at the Complexo Hospitalari de Navarra in, in Pamplona. Professor Francisco Maizano is head of the Heart Center and chair of cardiovascular surgery at the University Hospital of Zurich. Uh, Professor Enrique Mora is the scientific director of our society and as well as the full professor at the University of Rio de Janeiro in cardiovascular surgery. And the research area is assistant professor of fac the Faculty of Medicine in Porto University and at the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery Residents <laughs> member. We're missing Tom, as uh, I told before, Tom who is the Chief Cardiac Surgery of the Department of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery at um, UT Health in uh, Houston. He's having problems with uh, COVID, he's risen very much over there. So uh, basically, I don't think he will, he'll be here at, at, at this time, but if he can, he'll try to join us. We've prepared uh, some questions, as it has been said, and we'll be starting so we don't take any more time. The first question I'll ask Rui Cerqueira. Rui, uh, do, do your medical schools have surgical cardiovascular disciplines, or is it the content offered in cardiology together? Oh, hello. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, quite a privilege to, to and an honor to, to participate in this session. Um, so to answer uh, to your question, it, it has been uh, the training in uh, medical school in cardiovascular surgery has not been uh, a fu fully individual uh, discipline in medical uh, in our medical school, but for some years our team uh, has been working to uh, to close the gap uh, between undergraduate training, fundamental sciences, clinical cardiology, and cardiovascular surgery. And we have uh, actually for 
about five years now, uh, created a, an official uh, discipline in the, in the pre-graduate uh, integrated masters of medicine in Porto. We have created a joint discipline called cardiovascular diseases, uh, including clinical cardiology, cardiovascular uh, surgery, uh, or, or better to say, cardiac surgery and vascular surgery. And uh, this is this is a, a, a is is being a fantastic experience uh, for students and also for 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 our teachers. We we have uh, seminars and lectures with integrated teams for from several backgrounds, discussing, discussing uh, variated clinical um, uh, problems uh, that with, um, with our different backgrounds and our different approaches in a, in a true heart team, uh, heart team model. And we also, we also like to, to get our medical students from the beginning in, integrated in our work as, uh, as uh, cardiovascular surgeons and we, we have voluntary programs where they can join and they can uh, follow us to the OR and have live discussions of uh, cardiovascular physiology. We, we are having a very good experience in integrating our uh, medical students from early in their uh, pathways in, our, in, uh, in cardiovascular surgery. I would say um, in our uh, university we have a similar situation in which uh, cardiac surgery has always been part of, of cardiology. Um, but uh, again, there is uh, the whole uh, syllabus and curriculum is being um, renewed and the concept is very much to, to have cardiovascular sciences all together and it becomes a journey uh, through the cardiovascular aspect from from car clinical point of view, surgical point of view, etc., but make it making it just a big uh, one discipline, so to speak. I think uh, here in Brazil we also have the cardiovascular surgery side, the the cardi cardiology subject, so I can relate to to both of you. And uh, as a as a member of the academic academic league in cardiovascular surgery, we try to bring the cardiovascular surgery closer to our students. So that's why I'm asking this second question is, do you have academic leagues of cardiovascular surgery in your university? And do you think they are interesting for the future of academics and the speciality? So I'd like to address this question to Professor Francisco. I don't understand what is this academic. Uh, can you explain me a little bit more? What is this? Uh, what you have in Brazil? Uh, here in Brazil, what are you have, representing? Yeah, these academic leagues are like small groups of academics that uh, are lead, lead with a cardiovascular surgeon, only to study this subject, but not in the curriculum, the the, the normal curricular. Um, normal curricular calendar. So we take extra time only to study this, this, a specific subject, in this case, the cardiovascular surgery. And yeah. we try to, to research and to write papers and to, to go to the wards with the surgeons and try to feel a little bit more of the speciality. So, so, it's, so it's a group, yeah. Sure. Uh, so in Switzerland, first of all, uh, Switzerland is, is a very uh, strange country. Every, every area of Switzerland has different uh, approaches. Very interesting, in my opinion, is what uh, we are seeing happening in many non-medical faculties. So uh, in, in our campus, we have uh, a technology institute, which uh, just instituted one two years ago, a bachelor in medicine. That's, I, I think, very important because the uh, profession is changing very rapidly. Uh, you know, it, it, look at cardiac surgery, what happened in 10 years, uh, huge uh, changes. But overall, uh, medicine is changing uh, very, very rapidly. We don't know in the, if uh, in 10 years' time we will have radiologists, let's say, make an example. So 
it's very interesting what happens outside of the medical faculty in the Technology Institute, you know, the ATH is, uh, is a very famous institution in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, where uh, even uh, Albert Einstein was, was a teacher there. And uh, they, they instituted this, this Bachelor of Medicine. And I have uh, several students coming to our uh, to our unit to look at uh, specific thematics. Like uh, uh, we we have uh, courses on uh, on uh, uh, on uh, biocompatibility. You know, as as cardiac surgeons, uh, although many people think the cardiac surgery is declining, but still, cardiac surgery is a pretty much uh, technological profession. So we have a lot of opportunities to work in close collaboration with uh, with in, with uh, with uh, these academic uh, partners, and also this is an opportunity for us to have a look at the new trends like uh, you know the digitalization of medicine, artificial intelligence. We have a number of uh, projects using uh, uh, virtual reality and artificial intelligence, uh, which is pretty interesting. So. Uh, I, there is a movement towards uh, more uh, uh, differentiated programs. If this is what you, you were mentioning about, yes, there is something there at the level of the medical school. I can add in, from the U.S. perspective, I think it depends on the institution, but most uh, large uh, programs, uh, training programs, have students that rotate through our services, and um, many of us have weekly meetings or uh, once every two weeks meetings where we're focus on, focusing on research topics, and it's very much open to uh, students and residents that are not already in cardiovascular surgery. So I think for them it's an opportunity to learn about the subject, but also to create to create the subject, create uh, new research avenues, and an opportunity for them to write abstracts and manuscripts uh, to get published. So I think that in the United States, I think it's very similar. Uh, we don't maybe call it an academic league as formally as, as other places do. Uh, for us, it's a surgical uh, cardiac surgery outcomes meeting that's every week, uh, but it's open to not just surgeons, but uh, oftentimes cardiology fellows and residents uh, come join as well if they have research projects that we're collaborating with them. Gaurav, do you think that uh, the students get interested in cardiovascular surgery and most of the people who uh, go over to your department will, will try to become cardiovascular surgeons? Uh, it's, it's a mix. So throughout an entire, let's say, one, a one-year time period, we will have maybe up to uh, 40 or 50 students that maybe 40 students that rotate with us that spend about two to three weeks with us throughout the year, all throughout the year, maybe about 40 students. And of those, uh, maybe about a little less than half may be interested in going into surgery, some type of surgical discipline, maybe first general surgery. And if you remember, you may or may not know in the United States, there are different pathways to become cardiac surgery. The most traditional is you first complete an entire general surgery residency and then do a, a specialization specialty fellowship in just cardiac surgery. We also have the new way in the United States, which is right from medical school, go straight into cardiac surgery. And so, you know, if you look at all of those avenues of, let's say, 40 students, maybe at the end of it, three or two or three may end up going into cardiac surgery at the, by the time they're completed training. So it's a very small percentage, but at the same time, it's also our, our one chance to teach students about cardiac surgery because many of them are gonna be internists, maybe them, many of them might be interested in cardiology, and we want them to have an appreciation for what we can offer in cardiac surgery to patients. So the, picking up what you just said, uh, our next question was just about that, and I'm gonna ask Professor Mura. Uh, what is the most viable uh, past perfect residence in cardiovascular surgery? Do you think we should go straight to uh, entry or go through general surgery, thoracic surgery before? And even that, I would ask, uh, ask also uh, uh, Professor Maisena to comment on. Uh, do you think that they should go through cardiology and interventional cardiology also? 
because I know that you made a, a, a great point on that in one of the meetings, that uh, the things were going to be the same, uh, the same pathway that will divide it at the end into the interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons will be the same thing. So let's start with the, uh, Professor Murat. Uh, we, we are having a few years back some problems with, with uh, surgeons going into cardiac surgery. And we start uh, a program to improve that because uh, we are losing a lot of bright surgeons uh, going into other specialties, uh, not to cardiac surgery. And uh, to our point of view, the general surgery residency was a problem because most of the surgeons, even the ones that want to go to cardiac surgery, once they start the general surgery program, uh, they, were, they, were, they changed the way they think and they went to other specialties like bachelor surgery or plastic surgery. So uh, um, about uh, four years ago, five years ago, we started to move and uh, we finally got uh, uh, a program that we can go direct into cardiac surgery. It's a, it's a five year program, not having general surgeon before. And it was uh, a surprising for us because um, we have many more students going into cardiac surgery than we have in the past. And uh, the result seems to be very good. And another difference we have that uh, now we have more women into cardiac surgery. And this make, make a, a large difference because nowadays here in Brazil, about 55% uh, of the graduates are women. And this is a, it's a big difference from 20 years ago when this number was about 20%. So I think for us at least, <clears throat> I think it's very important that we go direct into cardiac surgery because, uh, and we have to adjust our program. And very, at the beginning, we were afraid that we couldn't uh, adjust it, but uh, we could do it. And uh, now the residents, they go into in the program that they can, it's, it's the same like the American uh, pro integrate program. And I think, uh, it's, it's a major, major advance for us. Okay. Francesco, what's your opinion? So first of all, uh, what, is the, what is happening at the moment in Switzerland is very interesting. First of all, uh, it was previously uh, obligatory to go through two years of uh, general surgery. This uh, it has been uh, now discussed and basically has become not anymore obligatory. It is uh, something that uh, is on a vol voluntary basis. Uh, but very importantly, uh, it has been also cl clarified that uh, in, the, in the six years time, uh, there is a possibility to spend uh, one or two years into cardiology. So, in principle, the, the, the Swiss system is uh, uh, mixing the, the cards a little bit, uh, making a, a, a more interesting opportunity for, uh, for, uh, the, for, the, for those who want to become cardiac surgeons. They can go into different uh, units before getting into the surgical track. Whether this is going to be working or not, I'm not sure. I mean, this is a very interesting, but... Uh, is it going to work? I don't know, because in my opinion, the, be, the, the big problem at the moment is a, is a large problem of education. What is education? What, what do we, how do we define education? It was very simple. My father was studying on books, and these books were you know, valid for uh, 10, 15 years, 20 years probably. Uh, at the very end of his career, he had to learn some videoscopic uh, laparos laparoscopy. But, you know, for maybe for 30 years, he has been working with, uh, with, with those uh, instructions that he learned at, during the training. 
Today, training is uh, one step. You know, we are ongoing training. We are moving so fast. And since it takes uh, more or less eight to 10 years to, to build a cardiac surgeon, in 10 years' time, who knows what is going to be cardiac surgery? How many surgeons do we need? What kind of surgery will be done? There are a number of questions. So I think it's, it's very important, in my opinion today, to have a very flexible system that can be adaptable for the future. And to be honest, I, I also have a slogan. You know, when somebody asks me, what do you think about the future of, what, what should be the training? I always say, why you ask me? You should ask the, train, the trainees, not the trainer, because you know, they, they, they have the future in their hands. They know, they, they should know what they want. Now, obviously, there is still need for uh, a very strong and formal education for conventional surgeons. But this, you know, I, hear, I keep on hearing this conventional surgery. There is need for people who can open the chest. Sure, but this community of uh, surgeons should not be unaware of what happens outside of a conventional uh, area. So... I really believe that we need to sit down, reconsider cardiovascular medicine as a whole, because a good cardiac surgeon today should have, has to have a very strong uh, basic knowledge in cardiology, and only after that can be a good surgeon. Don't forget cardiac surgery started before cardiology. Nobody say that. But uh, before cardiac surgery became uh, a profession, there was no cardiology, there was no need for a cardiologist, there was just a small uh, unit inside of internal medicine, you know, they had a uh, few things to do, a bit of uh, digitalis, uh, digoxin, that's it. After cardiac surgery became possible, then all the diagnostics, the interventional procedures, everything has been uh, uh, really uh, uh, activated and the pioneers of cardiac surgery, they were basically cardiologists. They were very expert physiologists. They, they wrote the anatomy of the heart, the physiology of the heart, and so on. So we need to go back to this, understand that this is the, the structure, and only this way I think cardiac surgery remains appealing. Because it's a difficult job at the end of the day to be cardiac surgeon, much more difficult than being uh, you know, in, a, in a lab and doing echo for instance, in, in an ambulatory. For many people, it could be difficult. So flexibility is fundamental, in my opinion. Otherwise, we lose people over, over time. Yeah, I guess I would also like to add that the flexibility is important to recruiting. You know, there are, there are those people that are interested in, in the heart, and they identify themselves maybe even as medical students. And so that's an opportunity at that stage. And that's, you know, that's where maybe you're stealing students who might go into cardiology who go into cardiac surgery and i think that's one group the other group that we see we have a close relationship with our general surgery residents and many of them work in our research labs uh over they take two years off of their training and spend two years in a lab with us uh, and that's a great opportunity for people who already know they want to be surgeons and they're planning to go into surgery, but um, teach them about the, our enthusiasm and all the, the great technology and advances in cardiac surgery. So I, I do think the flexibility is important. I think Francesco alluded to the need from a 10,000 foot view for the specialty, but even on an individual level, you, you find gems everywhere. Students that decide they might be more interested in surgery, they're already interested in, card in heart, and then also surgeons that are interested already. They know want to, they want to be surg surgical residents, surgeons when they when they complete the training, but convince them that the heart is a really fun place to be. So I like that flexibility, and that works well for us in the U.S. as well. Uh, our next question was going the same way. So, Professor Rafael, uh, how do you, how do you think we how can we bring uh, the best and brightest students to our residency programs? Well, that's. Uh, very difficult. At least up in Spain, up to about 15 or 20 years, the top best uh, students will, will, because we have a national ranking system for students to choose the specialty, very similar to Portugal. The top 
top 30 or 40 would come to cardiac surgery. It was very cool, you know, be a cardiac surgeon. Now has gone down the drain. No, no one wants to do cardiac surgery. Now there is much more in cardiology, for instance. Um, in the last three years, two, of, two students that uh, we had in, in, in our team uh, ended up, and then I met them afterwards, and they went through to cardiology, and, I, and they told me, it was my time in cardiac surgery which made me love cardiology, and then they went into cardiology. Yeah, because it's cooler these days, you know. Um, and it's becoming difficult, you know. As, as uh, Francesco say, said, it's, it's not easy to be a cardiac surgeon. It's tiring, responsibility. Um, it's probably not well paid for many. Uh, so it's very difficult to make it attractive. And I, I think that the concept that has been already mentioned of flexibility and uh, be able to show the, the students that uh, there are many ways of, of getting to, to becoming a surgeon is important. And, and we don't have that in our system at present. We've been trying to, to, to change the training program uh, for cardiac surgery in Spain for over 12 years. And there's always been administrative issues that we haven't which have prevented us to changing it. But the, the project is quite ambitious in that, in that sense. Um, and we are trying to, there is a fair amount of interventional, uh, uh, let's call it cardiology in it. But so far we have not been successful. So uh, do, do you think that uh, when we had uh, an eight year program of residence, because in the States they used to have that, eight years and then they would go one year over to Europe to be after being chief residents so over if you wanted to do pediatric cardiac surgery or something like that. Do you think time of, uh, of formation of those um, young doctors was the main problem not to go to the residents and now that we're cutting over to six years of uh, residents they might be coming again because we saw that in, in, uh, in Brazil. Am I right? We, I, I think there is, um, I have some slides and I can present uh, later on if you wish, but one of the issues which will affect uh, training in the future is the new generations. And you cannot compare the millennials or the Z generation with, with previous generations. They have other interests. Um, they want to, to see, you know, thinking in 10, 12 years time is not good for them. And we have to think in, in that. The generations have changed a lot and the way they, they see, they look at, at life overall and, and training. So, shall we move to the ne next part? Uh, uh, can we change the recruitment process? H how, how are you doing for, the, uh, for people go to go over to your residence? Do you have a, an exam? Uh, can you choose them after interviewing them? And that's a very important part because uh, over in Brazil nowadays, they do the exams and, and uh, the curriculum is only 10% of the, of the whole uh, 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 of the of the way to choose them, and the rest is the exam on the general medicine. And apart from that, in some places you cannot even interview the candidate. So this is a problem of, uh, for us over here. Uh, how do you do it at home? Let's start with uh, Francesco. So this is a very important question, and uh, it's related, in my opinion, to the previous one of flexibility. Because one of the main challenges I have today is uh, when somebody comes fresh of medical studies and say, I love cardiac surgery. How do you know if this person will be the right person? Because we all you know it I can only train one surgeon every two years. Our volumes are not that much. So I can accept one cardiac surgery uh, residency for, for per year. At the beginning, obviously, they are busy in uh, in uh, in the world, so they they you know the first years are uh, years where they need to become doctors, medical doctors. So this is the time where they can switch to cardiology. Most of them switch to cardiology afterwards. But still, the problem is we select a limited number of people because uh, these are people coming because they want to become cardiac surgeon, which is already s strange why somebody should choose cardiac surgery today. Uh, so they are also usually uh, s strange uh, young guys uh, who, are, who like to be more invasive. They like the idea of uh, cutting the skin. You know, they, they like this concept of invasivity. 
which is the opposite that we need at the moment. We need to have uh, uh, physicians who are 360 degrees. So that's why I believe that the integrated uh, cardiovascular medicine school would serve the uh, interest of, the, of everybody much better because we could uh, actually, at the beginning, enroll uh, physicians into a common trunk. In the first two, three years, you need to teach these people how to take care of patients, including how to take care of a cardiac surgery patient. But it, it is just learning to be a cardiologist. You need to learn the basics. And only after a common trunk, then you can really understand those who really are more interventionals, more uh, non-interventional. And within the interventional ones, then you can identify those who want to go into surgery, those who would like to be interventional cardiologists or whatever. I mean, this is the way to expand uh, also the pool of candidates and to have a contact with uh, multiple uh, uh, potential uh, future surgeons. The way we do today is really uh, limiting our opportunities. So we need to change it as soon as possible. You know, it's difficult because the academic system is very, very blocked. But uh, I still, when I interview a new candidate, I say, you know, you come to me, you will not come, you will not operate. I want you to become a doctor first. You need to understand cardiology. You will not, you can come to the operating room, you can look whatever you want, but you will not operate. It's not, there is no reason to operate. And only after one year, we can discuss. So I think that is very important today. If we can, if you can organize in your institution a common trend for cardiovascular medicine, including cardiologists and, and cardiac surgeons, in theory, I mean, people, these, these are all students. So this would be a game changer, in my opinion. So in Spain, we have a system which is, is just an exam after medical school and it's, it's, a, it's a national system. So it's just, it's just an exam. So you only measure um, knowledge. And I think that that is the, the wrong way to go about it. Um, if I can, I have a slide here. If, we, if I could uh, uh, share it with you. Um, sure, you can. The, 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 the type of things that I think we should be we should be able to to look at, and I think for for, for selection pro, uh, for selection uh, criteria, there are things that um, that we should uh, look at in in, in surgeons to be, isn't it? Um, so um, things like uh, uh, hold on a sec. Yeah. So if if you are going to be a surgeon, you need to have some. Um, uh, manual dexterity because in many systems you only have to pass an exam so you, you could be only one hand person and still become uh, make it to, 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 to the process. You should be able to solve complex, complex problems and, and that takes uh, out of the question many people. <clears throat> As surgeons you are obliged to work in a team and you have you, you must know how to work or lead the team you have to take responsibility for your patients. You have to show commitments and obviously communication skills. And all of these are things that can be measured uh, in a selection process. And, and it's been shown in different studies <coughs> that you can measure manual uh, the, uh, skill proficiency very well. And, and also you can measure um, how to, to if, if, if the candidate is able to work or, or lead in a team. Um, and I think these are <clears throat> matters which have not been taken into account in, in, in most of the selection process and that should be taken into account. Yeah. Surely. Uh, Gaurav, would you like to...? Yeah, I think uh, the, so the process in the United States is through a match process and that matching um, comes after the candidate usually interviews with programs and that each candidate might interview with maybe 15 or 20 programs across the United States. You know, there are metrics that are used, including how their grades are, their letters of recommendation, uh, 
as well as um, their exams uh, or the USMLE board exams. Um, and based on those things, uh, each, each program decides who they want to invite for an interview. And then after the interview, there's a rank process. And so I think maybe on a, on a broader scale of, of how we recruit, um, the, to us, the most important um, key in the recruitment process is your current trainees. Uh, our current trainees spend a lot of times, uh, a lot of time spent with the applicants when they come for visits. Uh, we typically have two or three days out of the year that we um, block off ORs and, and interview our candidates. And uh, on those days, our current residents trainees uh, spend a lot of time with the applicants. And if we give that, if we give our current residents a good exposure, experience, let them operate then they sell the program very well. We don't, we as the faculty don't really need to do a whole lot um, other than try to select as best we can who the best fit for the program is. For me, the most important quality that anybody needs to have is that they want to be a cardiac surgeon more than anything else. Um, and to that extent, they sacrifice, they're willing to sacrifice uh, a lot to do that. And so other than that, I mean, we don't do any visio spatial testing. I think that's a great idea, but I think in the U.S., places that have done that, it's been not received well. Uh, so we tend to not necessarily do that as much as might, might be uh, a good idea. Um, but if they have a strong desire and a strong work ethic and they work well with teams, um, then they'll fit in well in, in most programs. So to me, the, the key for recruitment really is the current residents, um, if they have a good experience and they spend a lot of time with the applicants on interview days, they'll sell the program very well. Uh, I've got two questions from the audience. One is from Ryan Freitas. Uh, she asks, uh, she's a fifth year medical uh, student from Brazil, and she's asking the question, what sort of behavior skills are essential for a future particle cell search development? I think Raf has uh, pointed that in the, his slides, so let's start with Raphael. What do you think is essential for a, a future cardiovascular surgeon to develop? What skill, type of skills, apart from manual ones? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm very much uh, in agreement with what Francesco was saying, that um, I think we are probably going to be more so to speak, more cardiologists than, than general surgeons. Um, and I, I agree that we should probably have uh, uh, one discipline with different kind of, of technicians. Uh, Francesco is obviously the paradigm of, of what uh, a cardiac surgeon should be, what other skills a cardiac surgeon should, should develop. And I think he's the best person to, to answer this question. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you for, uh, Rafael, you know, I appreciate it because you are also a, a role model in education. You have been always very much involved into this. And I think, uh, you know, when the question, what is the most important skill for a cardiac surgeon? My answer is the ability to take responsibilities. I tell you why, and I think it's very important to... Uh, to share this, uh, this uh, experience. I am an old generation cardiac surgeon already. Um, I, I studied cardiac surgery on the Kirkins book. For those who have been reading the Kirkins book in the, in the 90s, there was something strange to me that uh, all the data were reported with a confidence interval of 70%. Uh, which was not uh, typical for, uh, for scientific publications. Then I had the opportunity to meet uh, Blackstone once, and I asked him, why did you write in your book always 70% and not 95%, like in any publication? He said, you know what? When we were writing that book, we didn't know much. We didn't have so many cases, but still we had to take decisions. And if we use the 95% confidence interval for a decision, we would never take a decision. So 
the reality is that we live in a field where most of our decisions are taken with uh, this kind of a big uncertainty. And it takes uh, a lot of responsibility to go in one direction, but you need to take this direction. And uh, when you take the direction, the second important skill is to be leader. Because if you really go into cardiac surgery, you're going to be the leader of the team. You're going to be leading the team. And so leadership is a, is a big, big uh, uh, issue. I had uh, an, excellent, uh, an excellent surgeon in training who had uh, some uh, social skills issues. He had communication issues. And I had to tell, sorry, this is not your job. Although you can operate, I mean, you will never be in a leading position. If, if you operate in an operating room, it's not, you know, the outcome is not made by the, the fine maneuvers of anastomosis. The outcomes are, are, are really uh, coming out of uh, being able to manage the team, be part of a team, to manage the team, and to take responsibility. So I think, uh, you know, any, anyone can operate. You can teach manual skills to everybody. You can train them. What is not so easy is to, to train somebody who has not a natural uh, uh, approach to leadership. This is much more difficult to find out. Uh, I'll address this next question to Hui. Uh, talking about uh, the, the hours of a week work, do you think uh, 60 hours is a magical number for our residency programs? Do you think it's not enough? Or we know that here in Brazil we have uh, a limit of hours that a resident can work, but uh, most residency programs, they don't... Uh, they don't count on that. We need to work much more than that uh, and research much more in, in extra time also. Uh, you as uh, a resident, what do you think about it? I'm definitely not a, a, an expert uh, in this field. I can, I can uh, tell uh, a little bit about, about the reality uh, in our country and, uh, and in Europe. I had the opportunity, the fortunate opportunity to, to work in the residence committee recently. And one of our tasks was to do a follow-up survey on, on training in, um, in, uh, in cardiothoracic surgery in Europe. Uh, the first one was done about 10 years ago, and now we, have, we had a new one that we run last year. And I, I would like to, maybe I would like to share some, uh, some pictures with, uh, this, uh, this is a, a work that has been submitted uh, for, for review, review, where we are hoping we can publish it. But um, I hope you can see this picture here. Okay, can you all please? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, so as you see, our survey has focused on on some topics. One of those was uh, uh, working time workload, and uh, in fact, six sixty seems to be the, the magical hours because it's 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 a number that happens to to happens a lot in, in training and uh, the, the average workload for for cardiothoracic training in Europe was in our survey of 61 uh, hours a week but uh, th there are some issues regarding regarding this I, I think that the, the number per se is not uh, is not uh, necessarily the most important uh, in to topic the, the the type of uh, of activities and the way these hours are spent might might be some important might be important and you can uh, you can check check here the the distribution of the the, the workload among different types of activities the the typical week of a, a, a cardiothoracic resident in a, in a, in Europe uh, and uh, there are some issues that I would like to to, to speak about so we we found a. a a statistically significant association be between spending more uh, hours in the in the OR and more sessions as a primary surgeon, uh, and there was a significant uh, statistically significant association between this and the satisfaction, the overall satisfaction of trainees with their residency program. So, if we say that we are asking our residents 
uh, at least this is my interpretation from this data, that we are asking our residents to spend 80 hours per week or 60 hours per week in the, in, the, in the hospital, but they are doing mostly administrative work and not spending their time in the OR or working as a primary surgeon. That at least they are not satisfied with that, with that, with that course of time. And there was a, also an inverse uh, uh, association between working as in admi administrative uh, tasks and, uh, and overall satisfaction. There is in Europe uh, uh, also some rules, some, some, some laws that uh, uh, everyone should be obeying, the, the, the European Working Time Directive. There are some national versions of this concept, but it's actually a, a limitation that you can see in this graph of 48 hours per week and uh, should be applied in all residency programs. This is not a reality. Uh, most, most programs do not apply this, this working time directive limitations in their programs and almost half of uh, our residency, 40, 42% of our residents are not even aware of the existence of a, of a, a legal limitation for their working time. So 10 years after the, the, the first survey by, by, by Professor Sadawa and their colleagues, at their time working in also in the, the residence comedy, uh, there seems to be no relevant changes related to working time. Um, trainees are working same hours and uh, are doing so regardless of any regulations. But uh, we, we do feel that uh, this should be uh, implemented in residency programs. I think it's not a matter of quantity, it's a matter of, uh, of quality. With, with some changes in, uh, and some innovative uh, approaches and training in designing training programs, maybe uh, less is more and maybe we can, we can have better prepared residents and the, the next generation of surgeons without having them to, to spend uh, 60 or 80 or 100 hours per week at, at the hospital. And I, I would like to uh, quote uh, Professor Sadava in a, in a, in a uh, paper that was written in 2004, a couple of years ago, uh, about this topic. And uh, I would like to say that a uh, quote, never before, and this was, was 2004, but I think it, it, it applies now. Never before have a, a, cardiac, a cardiothoracic surgeons have been accountable as they are currently are, and never before have there been so many ex many expectations placed on them. And yet, cardiothoracic trainees are asked asked to limit their time, the time they spend in the uh, in teaching hospitals, in order to, to comply with working time directives. The cardiothoracic surgeon of the 21st century will have to be trained in trained in a 48-hour week setting, and novel and innovative training uh, strategies will have to be introduced. To, the, to teaching of this speciality. The time residents spent at their teaching units, units will have to be optimized for learning. We have to evolve from the concept of trainees as apprentices to the concept of trainees as learners. I do really like this, uh, this quote from Professor Sadawa. Okay, so the, uh, let me ask uh, Rafael, uh, he, he, you pointed the, uh, that uh, this new generation is different from us. I think uh, I'm one of the oldest ones, and I trained for uh, eight years as a resident, four of them uh, uh, in London, and we had uh, more or less 80 to 100 hours per week of working because we were every other day on call uh, inside the hospital. We, we used to have accommodation over there. And apart from that, if you wanted to do research, you had to do it on a free time, not go to the pub and stay over doing research. So uh, I think the, the older generation, which is the uh, cardiac surgeons 40 to 70 years of age, they trained in a different way. But we, we wanted to, uh, to, uh, to, to be on, on the, in the field every time. And uh, this new generation, as you pointed, the millennium ones, they, they have other sort of what life is. So they're very completely different. They don't want a, a car, they want a, a Uber, they don't want their house, they want their holidays. So they're completely different from what we were. We were workaholic. I don't know if we were right or not, but I would like to, to see your opinion and the opinion of Gora from the United States. Sure, uh, I think there's, there's a, a different way of thinking about it. You, you know, you mentioned 
maybe maybe we got it wrong. Maybe the new generation has life figured out in a better way, and maybe their happiness will be better than ours. But but uh, you know the the point is that I don't think this is necessarily about the hours. This is really about uh, training, and so we have to separate. You know, you were on every other uh, night. I was on for part of my residency every other night, and then it changed at the tail end to every third night. And as soon as we go away from work that needs to be done for the purposes of the patient to what is the best opportunity to learn, then I think we find the happy medium. You know, um, the, the data that was just presented, clearly if we institute 60 hours, there are going to be opportunities that residents feel like they miss. They're going to miss opportunities to learn, opportunities to operate. And maybe the answer shouldn't be uh, a restricted hour amount, but it should be to, that they feel like they're maximizing their learning. Um, and in that manner, we should also provide a safe environment for residents to say, hey, I've been working very hard. I've been up for two nights in a row. It's not safe for me to do this next operation. And we, as the educators, should feel comfortable saying, absolutely not, you need to go home and rest, uh, and we will get you an opportunity to learn at another time to do what's safe for the patient. So I don't think as much, even though we have hours restrictions of 80 hours a week, I don't think there's a magical number. I think we need to change the philosophy of from hours to learning opportunities uh, and not think about this as a service that needs to be done, but maybe provide um, more learning and less focus on somebody needs to be on call every night. Well, yeah, so, so we did a, a, a review of the literature looking at how did the working hours restrictions had affected uh, operating opportunities. We ended up only being able to look at the, at the US because there was very, very few written and from elsewhere in the in the world, and and we published it a few years ago, and it was obviously at the end of the residency in the new AT hours environment, the number of operations were overall less, but there were some programs, at least four programs, in which the uh, op operating uh, uh, operations records were actually higher after the uh, AT hours restriction. That's, that was number one finding. Number two was that in, uh, after the, the restriction, the residents were getting better marks in their exams than before. That's probably because they had more time to, to read and, and study than before. And the third finding was that um, the operating experience was shifting from previous, uh, for the first few years of training towards the end. So whereas in the beginning, residents were doing less operating, at the end, they were doing uh, more than, than before. So they were our findings. It was not a big impact, or at, as le at least as much as, as one would have, would have thought. And I entirely uh, agree with Wade Cerqueda that if you, you can optimize the time residents spend in hospital, uh, you don't need to do something, uh, you know, you don't need to harvest 1,000 brains to, to become competent on brain harvesting. Once you've done, once somebody who is able to evaluate and assess that you, you can do harvesting, you can move on to the next step and, and, and so on. In my point of view, the uh, establishing block here is how we overcome the learning curve because that's what, that's what the untrained surgeon can uh, damage patients and harm patients mainly. And how we concentrate on taking trainees to the learning curve of whatever procedures they are doing, I think that's a, a key for the future. And I, as I said, I don't think numbers are the most important factor for this. If I could add uh, just a, a, a point. So, so uh, Professor Sadaba has, has such a, an important point. Most of, uh, res most of the residence programs that are, residency programs that are, I know, at least in Portugal, have, uh, have uh, an evaluation system that's ret retrospective. Uh, and this is a problem with, with lengthy uh, residency programs like cardiac surgery, which is five or six years. So our study in our survey has actually showed that trainees who receive regular 
evaluation of their work are significantly more satisfied. So structured feedback, uh, uh, well-structured training programs with uh, regular reports on, on activities can track trainees' uh, progress and can at least, uh, in a way, orient uh, their, their surgical activities towards those things that need improvement. That, that's our belief. Do you have log books for residents in Portugal? In Portugal? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's compulsory to to show your log. So in book. Europe, you you all all have log books, from what I see. I think it's 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 a widespread a uh, widespread uh, way of doing. Yes, yes. Okay. I'd like to address this next question to Professor Francesco. Uh, what are the major pitfalls in today's residency program? Well, we already heard a lot of these uh, pitfalls. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, one of the main challenge uh, it was uh, in talking about training uh, and evaluation. And I, I like the last comment about retrospective evaluation. This is a problem. I think uh, I also believe that the main, uh, the main problem today is how we do certify progress. And uh, the challenge of, of uh, restrictive working hour is a big challenge, I have to say. You know, I, I agree that we can optimize. On the other hand, uh, expertise is built on uh, exposure. And, uh, you know, we, you need to see a number of cases to develop uh, uh, enough expertise to take the right decisions. So how do we how do we tackle this issue is is going to be one of the problems. I believe that uh, we can uh, uh, probably uh, improve uh, the learning curve by introducing more of, more uh, aggressively simulation based training and certification. This is the big issue here. We do a lot of a lot of activities, you know, a lot of uh, web labs and whatever, but these are more like uh, playgrounds. In my, uh, in my practice, we already initiated to introduce uh, simulation-based certification, which is a step to go to the next step. So I'll give you one example. In my clinic, uh, ECMO implantation can be done only if they pass an exam. And this exam is testing knowledge, skills, and uh, troubleshooting capabilities. I think we need to introduce this more often, more uh, spread into the, into the programs. It is a gigantic work. Uh, I try to do it, but I think it, it has to be a, a, an international, a multi-institutional effort. We need to put all together uh, our, our strengths because we need that. We need to, you know, simulation-based training is solving the issue of the lack of volumes. Uh, it's solving the issue of, uh, of, uh, of standardization and it's solving the issue of certifying knowledge and skills, which is the most difficult thing to be done on a passion. You know, I tell you one story again about my, my career in Alabama. I remember I went to Alabama. I was at UAB working with Albert Pacifico. For those who saw Pacifico, remember the guy. He was a great surgeon. And as a foreign fellow, I was not allowed to uh, be second uh, uh, operator. I was always in the third position with my suction element all the time uh, for one year. One day, the, the, ch the chief resident had the diarrhea and had to run. So I had the privilege to be first assistant of Professor Pacifico. And I was so stressed because this guy was a, was a very, very... Uh, very fast and it was very demanding and so there was one step of the procedure where I knew all the steps I was ready but there was one step of the procedure where I should tie a knot on the arterial cannula 
and I was so stressed that well, I made a loose knot. Pacifico didn't say nothing, just uh, pushed me away and, and he made the knot and he went forward. And then in the Sunday meeting, he was always making a Sunday meeting with all the fellows in, the, in, the, in this blue room. The Sunday meeting, he, he, he said, you know, it is unethical to learn skills on the patients. You need to learn your skills. You need to train yourself on whatever you want. At that time, he, he said, you know, a pillow, whatever. But today, we have, we have much more than pillows. So we need to implement this for safety for the patients, for speeding up the training process, and also to standardize evaluation because you know it's a big responsibility as a, as a chief of department. You need to be sure that you don't have people who are not at the level which is needed. So I think we should really try to work all together to uh, to create modules. It should be, however, really a, a multi-institutional effort. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I would like to know the opinion of Professor Murat also, talking about the pitfalls in Brazilian residency program. See, there's a, a the residency program. Here we have a, a very different uh, standards for service. We have service that are not uh, in, in which the residents are more uh, labor than uh, training. They use the residents more lab for labor than training. And we have tried to correct that. And I think we have been array, are able to do it. In terms of working hours, I agree with Dr. Marizano. The most important thing for the residents is responsibility. When I was a resident, I was a resident in 1973. That's a long, long time ago. At that time, we used to have 128 hours a week. So I remember I used to see my wife almost every 15 days or so. And uh, I think that that was too much. And uh, it was easy to have burnout. But uh, nowadays I see that when I have a responsible resident, usually he doesn't work 60 hours a week. He goes more and more because at that time when I was resident, I, I have the feeling that my work never ends because there was something that I had to do. And I see that residents nowadays, with the working hours, they want some more. And they, the good residents, they, have, they want more things to do. So usually, it's not exactly the 60 hours a week. They go to 70, 80, 90 hours a week sometimes. And, uh, for Brazilians now, I, the major pitfall we have is, uh, is the different residencies, the residency programs around the country. And we are trying to unify this. And most likely we will we'll be able to do so but, you know, in a short period of time. But this is our main problem nowadays. I will have to thank uh, uh, Professor Rafael Sadaba for being here. Uh, I know he told me before he's got a long list tomorrow and uh, time is going up, so we'll excuse him. Uh, thank him for being here. I know it's trouble. We have to start, to start doing these webinars at, uh, at the morning in Brazil, so it will be lunchtime over in, the, in um, Europe. Uh, thanks thank a lot, you. I, I, I'm sorry I have to leave, but I have to be back uh, up in a few hours' time for a long list. So, very much for the invitation. This is a great activity. Congratulations, and I let you with uh, carry on with the activity. Thank you again. Bye. My next point will be to, to Gaurav. Um, I think you and Francesco have uh, the same way of feeling. Uh, we had a, a question from Ana Paula, which Francesco knows well. She says that uh, she wants to learn uh, uh, cardiac surgery in her residence because medicine and cardiology he learned when she was a student. But I have a point that the uh, cardiac surgeons nowadays have to spend some time over at the cat lab. Uh, and we have some problems with interventional cardiologists because most of them won't, won't let us go into, into their lab. And here in Brazil, it's, uh, it's commonly. Uh, over in the States and uh, over in Europe, they are uh, state-owned or by the university, so it's different. But uh, 
how long do you think this uh, uh, time should be in the cat lab? Do you think it should be a year uh, straight on uh, on the cat lab, or do you think they should be doing uh, together with the conventional surgery, endovascular surgery, so they get the skills afterwards to decide what they want to do after the residence, a fellowship in endovascular surgery, or whatever? Yeah, I think that's a good question, um, and you know, similar to the different pathways to cardiac surgery, I think there could be different models. It doesn't have to be the same at every place. Um, for example, our uh, residents that are in, in the I-6 program, so they finish medical school and they go into cardiac surgery, there are probably three or four times throughout their six years that they're spending uh, a month in the cath lab. And so they, for that, those folks, it's spread out. Um, and then, as you, you may have heard, there's also the uh, STS and the Thoracic Surgery Foundation uh, are funding or partially funding uh, spots that are one year to do a structural heart fellowship at select centers in the United States. And that'll be on the, uh, roughly six to 12 months, depending on, on the person. I think at the end of the day, similar to what was mentioned earlier, it's about skills. So if a trainee can, can complete the skills that are necessary, then um, the timing, the, the amount of time that's spent um, can vary based on how much experience and exposure they have. Um, I, I tell you that the key really is that heart team. And, um, you know, example is today I did a um, redo mitral clip. Somebody had already had a mitral clip about a year ago somewhere else. And then we did a very complicated TAVR. Um, um, so our resident who just started today, our fellow just started today on July 1st, his first day, he scrubbed on both cases. Now, he doesn't have a whole lot of skills yet. Um, he has completed his general surgery residency. He knows how to operate, but he doesn't have a lot of cardiology skills. He doesn't have a, a lot of catheter skills yet. But we gave him small little tasks in terms of accessing the vessels, in terms of uh, proposing the vessels that we think he's already had some exposure to, crossing the valve, we let him attempt those things. So it, little small tasks that they can start learning while they're learning the cardiology side of it is absolutely critical. Now, if a resident doesn't show that effort that they're learning the cardiology side, it definitely gets harder for a cardiologist to train a cardiac surgeon if they're not showing the effort of learning the knowledge of cardiology. I think the, the, the issue is also the opportunity. So you, you mentioned there is a problem to access to the, the training. And uh, it, first of all, it very much depends on uh, how the, 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 our, our clinics are structured until we have a uh, separated education, separated budget, it will be always the same. Uh, the problem is a very uh, basic problem. You know, if we don't change now, you know, there is a risk that cardiac surgery, by reducing the volumes, we also have, we need to join in another direction. So you may see, particularly in smaller hospitals, surgeons who are going to become uh, thoracic, vascular, and cardiac surgeons, again, like in the past. So become less, uh, less uh, specialistic. Maybe some of them will start doing some hernia just to make some money for food. For food. So if it, I, I hope this is not the case because if we really want to keep the standards as high as possible, we need highly specialized people who can work in big teams. Now, to, uh, to achieve this goal, we have to convince the community that a cardiac surgeon should not stem out of, uh, of the blue. should be probably one of the most uh, promising young generation physician who has uh, incorporated all the best skills, manual skills, uh, uh, social skills, uh, research, uh, education, whatever. And so how do we achieve that? We achieve that also through 
a, a exposure into cadre-based uh, uh, technologies. And how does it work? So I tell you, it's very simple. I got my education because my cardiologist needed to have somebody on his side at that time. Yeah, we're talking about the year 2000, 2002. We are at the beginning of these ideas. There was not even a case done. We were working with animal in the animal lab. And so at the beginning of the 2000, it became uh, clear that there was a need for some more uh, uh, interactions. Today, is more there is too much fight. Okay, there is there is fight for achieving this this position, but if we also go. You need to think about ten years ahead. You know, I don't think that there will be anybody implanting Tavi in ten years from now. There will be a machine doing this. I mean, this is absolutely doable. So we should really think much broader than we do today and understand that. Uh, a, a, a wire is a tool, just like a mitre tip. I always say mitre tip is not a therapy. You know, I hate the concept. Mitre tip is a tool. It's a 5 -oh proline on, on the lipids. I mean, it's, it, it's not the, the mitre It doesn't do the work. It's the operator who puts the mitre tip in the right position that makes the work. So we have to, to go one step forward. Otherwise, there is an alternative, which is also possible. If there is no collaboration, which sometimes happens, then you need to do all what you can to get a hybrid room. No hybrid room, no way you play. It's just like, you know, you want to play soccer, you need, at least you need to have a ball. If you don't have a ball, you can't play. So you need this room. And this has been a big mistake of many surgeons who have been very reluctant at the very beginning to engage into this business. So if you have an hybrid room, it's already done. It's not a problem. You know, these are skills that can be learned. These are serious skills. It's not easy. I mean, it's not that you can bail out and you can do that. No. You need to really go to school, learn, seriously. It is, it is possible. It is doable. But uh, it's a serious project. And the idea of rotation for everybody doesn't work. You know, it does not work. Imagine you are operating in the operating room and you are forced to train somebody to do aortic valve replacement, okay? So you have to go on the other side, somebody who rotates, you will never see this person anymore. Comes a cardiologist for six months and you are forced to let him do aortic valve replacement. It doesn't work, you will not let do it. It does not work, rotation is not a concept has to be integrated. The rotation is, is only a fake uh, solution. The reality is, you know, in a, in a department, you know, every year you need to have a, a, a session where we all together, we sit down and say, okay, how many people do we need in the hybrid room? How many people we need in the operating room in the next 10 years? And then provide the training for these people. This is what we need to do. We need to be more uh, 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 based on on the needs of the op op on the operational needs rather than on on the uh, uh, power politics here. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I'll continue with our other questions to Professor Murat. Uh, thinking about the the new technologies that are are becoming most more common in the daily basis of the da daily life of the cardiac surgeon. Will the cardiac surgeon expect, what will the cardiac surgeon expect after finishing the residence? Will they be able to start practicing on their own or they will need more protectorship and uh, continue learning and to, to continue learning and improving their techniques? Uh, as you see, most of our cardiac surgeons in this, they will go working in a team and they start in this team, they will get uh, higher and higher level of activity. Usually, the cardiac, the just graduated, just finished residency cardiac surgeon, it's very difficult for him to run a service alone. He has to be in a team, and usually this, uh, with the team, it gets 
uh, the chance to improve his knowledge slowly and slowly because the knowledge is a so, so, uh, is a you have to get lots of information and the sum of all this information will give you turn you uh, a very good surgeon. So you need some time. Okay, I, I would ask. Uh, I want uh, the four of you to give me uh, your feelings about mentors, because uh, this is one of the problems that we had a uh, long time ago. We had our mentors because they were only the cardiac surgeons, and they were the best ones. You can, uh, I had uh, I trained with uh, Magdi Yakub, with uh, uh, Ross uh, Stark, and Mark Bilibal. They were really great people because behind teaching, they were human and they will try to, to tell me what I will be going to do. For example, I remember Mark Leval telling me, you know, if I'm going to do ca pediatric cardiac surgery, you're going on, on, on the cabbages because that's where the money is. So, uh, and he was not very, uh, very wrong saying that. So what do you think we have to change uh, the mentor's uh, uh, way of thinking so they can adapt to being uh, a high, what I call a hybrid surgeon who could do conventional surgery as well as end of a surgery, minimum invasive surgery or not? Uh, I can start. Uh, so I, I'm sure Francesco is similar. Um, being someone that thinks like a hybrid surgeon early on in a field where that was not necessarily accepted, it's a tough path because the other component of being a transcatheter surgeon is there are other surgeons that don't believe in the therapy. And so I think you have to be a, a leader and believe in it. And I think the younger surgeons, especially now, are realizing the importance of transcatheter therapy. So, so I think first is we have to practice what we preach, okay? And we have to really be able to straddle both uh, conventional surgery, minimal invasive surgery, as well as new transcatheter approaches. And honestly, that's what the fun and innovation is right now in cardiac surgery and cardiology is, is the new, all the new technologies and new ways of thinking, uh, new approaches to taking care of the disease. On a separate level, you talk about mentorship. I guess, you know, I, I have a, a talk that I gave to the um, residents uh, at the STS. All the residents in the U.S. have a uh, meeting, a thoracic surgery resident association. And this year I gave a, a talk to them on mentorship. I think the, the most important thing is um, we have to understand that we have a lot of influence uh, beyond just the patient care. We as leaders and um, in our own institution have a lot of influence and in how we carry ourselves, how we um, teach in the OR, how we talk to residents, how we value them and make them feel valued that goes a long way. They're gonna start doing the same thing as they get into their practice. And so for me, it's being the right role model, not just um, in the OR as, as a good surgeon, but also as a good teacher and a good mentor, and always be on the lookout for, for how can this individual improve, because this is our duty, this is our responsibility. If we're at a teaching program, whatever we teach them, they're going to go out into practice. If we fail to teach them certain things, you know, and, and I feel like this a lot of times at the end of uh, someone's training, I start thinking about all the things that maybe we haven't seen, all the complications that maybe we haven't had this particular year, and try to teach them this. Oh, these are all the things that can happen. Watch out for this. Watch out for that. Because that's my last opportunity to try to give them um, – the platform to learn before they go out and do things hopefully as safe as possible. So maybe I can comment uh, very quickly on on uh, mentorship. Uh, is uh, I I agree with you, uh, Gaurav. You you made a a great point that uh, you know we we learn we learn from our mentors how to behave, and uh, now we are role models for our uh, people. And this sometimes is difficult to be. Uh, but there is one point which is very important. I mean, I think uh, I, I, I have a number of mentors. Uh, I always say I have a father, grandfather, I have a brother. You know, Colombo is my brother, for instance. Uh, my father, my, my grandfather is Bahamian. My father is Alfieri. I have a 
I have learned from many people. And uh, the reality is that I'm not any one of those. I mean, I, I'm myself uh, with all my limitations, my advantages. I'm a different person. So we also have to uh, accept that uh, uh, we are role models, but uh, we should not be, uh, we should not create copy paste uh, uh, individuals. We need to leave uh, also some degree of freedom. And therefore, when I ask myself what is an ideal mixture between uh, endovascular, open surgery, minimal invasive, I have no idea, I guess. I, have, I know what I do, and I integrate everything in my practice. Whether this is re replicable, probably not. But I can tell you one area where I see a great advantage of being a surgeon who can use also cadres, and this is for sure my about interventions. Mitral and tricuspid in the hands of surgeons. I'm sorry for the interventional cardiologists, but if you have surgical background, you have much more knowledge. And if you can also operate these patients, then you really have a, a, a full spectrum of opportunities and you can take care of your complications in case you have a patient who doesn't go well. There is no drama, you are there. I mean, you can uh, really use all these tools in safe for patients without any bias. So that is an area which I believe surgeons should really dominate. Uh, Tavi probably is already different. It's uh, much more, you know, maybe it's not so important that every surgeon should do Tavi, but mitral, if you are a mitral surgeon, not doing mitra clip, not doing other procedures which are coming, it would be a great miss. I think you're not a modern surgeon. In terms of a mentor, I, I've been looking what the qualities of a mentor. And uh, I think the mentor has to be a good surgeon or a good intervention now, nowadays. He has to be a good teacher. But he also has to have some personal qualities for it. Usually, we cannot make someone a good mentor. Uh, it's, uh, it's a matter that uh, a lot of uh, personality of him will make him a good mentor. I have also very good mentors, and they have changed my, my life because they were role, role models for me. The first one I had was Professor Marian de Andrade in Brazil. He, was, he taught me how to, how to be a, a good surgeon, a good technician. How to, how to respect patients in, in he got me disciplined in surgery. When I went to the University of Illinois, Dr. Hiram Langson was a good, so was a personality for me. He taught me how to make it very simple, difficult cases, and how not to complicate on simple cases. And when I was chief resident, he taught me how to, to really uh, how to run a service. And the third one, just to remember what uh, I, I think of mentors, was Dr. Dudley Johnson in Milwaukee, and he taught me how to operate coronary arteries. But uh, besides of that, uh, he taught me never to accept uh, a surgery that was not perfect, and never to make any change when in data when you try to do a research, be very, very, very honest in research. So these are qualities for a mentor. And these are qualities that I look when I try to see a mentor in my service. I, I see a personality that can be a mentor. I have trained during my life several surgeons, they are chief, they are chief of service. But very few of them are really good mentors. It's very difficult to have a good, good mentor. Rui, what, what do you think about? From a trainee uh, perspective, all of the things, uh, I agree with all of the things uh, we, we have been hearing about this, this topic. But, but I, I think I, I could sum up from, let's say, a trainee perspective that I, I finished my residency a couple of weeks ago. And um, what I felt was the most uh, important thing for me as a as a trainee, as a resident, was was uh, having opportunities. 
not only I'm not speaking just about having opportunity to operate on just to having space uh, to 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 show my interest to show my uh, uh, capabilities to to uh, even not surgical related and uh, I I've been very lucky to 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 have uh, to have. Uh, a fantastic mentor during the whole my residency. I, I think I think it's a it's kind of a recipro reciprocal uh, relationship where, uh, let's say, my my enthusiasm and my uh, will to 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 uh, go forward uh, in some issues regarding technical issues and other the stuff have also improved my 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 mental practice. So I think that this this is a very important thing. So. If if the mentor feels uh, comfortable with his trainees, with his mentor, mentees, uh, I think both will improve, and this this is the kind of relationship that you, we should be aiming for. Uh, since we heard uh, the perspective from a, a, a new cardiac surgeon, I'd like to know about the old surgeons here, the elderly ones. Uh, what are your concerns about this new generation? What are what are we not doing right and how can we improve this as mentors? Can I ask, answer you? I mean, it's a nice question, but it's a little bit uh, generalistic. I think uh, a, a good mentor should individualize uh, the answer. I don't think it's a problem of generation. I mean, generations. You know, my generation is not the generation of my father, it's not your generation, it's not the generation of our grandparents. So I think it's a matter of uh, really uh, human beings. I, I think that we, we, we made the point that training is not limited to train uh, the hands or train uh, whatever. Uh, we try to build uh, human beings. We try to uh, to uh, improve your social skills, your uh, ability to be compassionate with patients, because we actually deal with uh, very complex situations, very often uh, uh, miserable ones. Not always we save life. I would say that we have uh, a number of... Uh, unfortunate cases there is nothing we can do out of this and this will always be, be the case and probably even more in the future if we focus on conventional surgery so i have nothing to blame to the next generation i only have to learn i need to adapt myself if i want to stay to practice this is the reality and this will be your problem in the future be ready to uh, to react to the to, to the time where you leave i mean uh, uh, to to stick to the past doesn't work you know, I am at the moment under uh, a, 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 an aggression. I, I'm, I'm attacked from different angles. One of the guys who's attacking me is a, is, a, is a very famous cardiac surgeon who has the, a problem against me. You know, he never applied the, the, the new interventions. He thinks that everything that goes through a cadre is an is a evil. Now, this guy has a terrible life. I mean, it's like uh, somebody who is living in, in, in this world and who still would like to go with a horse to work. I mean, you can't. You know, the, the time are changing. You need to adapt to the time. So the only thing I can tell you, uh, you know, the, the only uh, suggestion is to be ready to the generation that comes after you, which will be different than you. I think those are great points, Francesco. I guess to, to extend that... the. To me, it's, it's as leaders and then as the future leaders, always be willing to adapt. And that just that holds true with everything. It holds true with, with uh, the procedures that we're doing, the approach, like we've already discussed, but also holds true um, to how, how we train. And always be willing to adapt. And, you know, years ago, um, uh, one of the STS presidents used to say, learn a new procedure every year. I think you sh we should also be thinking as mentors, how do we keep innovating learning as well? And then the other thing that I think was mentioned, you know, all of us have mentors that have really shaped us, but clearly those mentor, that style of mentorship may not work for everybody. It might not work for this current generation. And we shouldn't just 
act in the same way that our mentors did. You know, it, it, if they uh, took an approach that was maybe more rigorous or harder or uh, would yell, you know, that doesn't mean that that's going to work today. And if we're ready to adapt, we're going to realize that that's maybe not the best approach. Uh, and as Francesco said, we're learning from our mentees how we can be better mentors. And so it's the ability to not be egotistical and be willing to change. The new generations, they'll, they'll get have a, a massive information that in the past you didn't have. So this massive information probably will make you run faster than we did in the past. So this is what uh, uh, we used to say about dinosaurs. Uh, the animals that will survive will not be the, the most uh, uh, bright nor the strongest one, but the ones who can adapt uh, better. So this is the transition that we have seen in cardiovascular surgery and uh, from what used to be before, before bypass, on bypass, then off bypass and the, and the endovascular. Well, as time is going, uh, going on and uh, Francesco is, go is already on my birthday day, so I I've got the, the last question for you. I'm going to join both uh, of them. So what do you think about cardiac surgery subspecialities like um, mitral aortic or cabbage or um, what are your, center, uh, are your thoughts about uh, centers of excellence in the future? Do you think it's a reality already to have centers of excellence for uh, aortic valve, say for example, uh, mitral valve, uh, because pediatric cardiac surgery is already uh, a center of excellence, uh, they don't have much of the general uh, cardiac surgeons don't do pediatric surgery. So we'll be having that, the guy who all only does transplants and elvats, we'll be having the guy who only does aortic valves in the, in centers of that. What do you think about the future? Think about the present. I mean, uh, if you need a surgery, you go to get somebody who does 200 mitals a year or to somebody who does 20. You want to go to somebody who has a big experience. So. If you are working in a large center, uh, you know, subspecialty is the best solution. I try to do that even in uh, Zurich where we are not that big, you know, it's, uh, it's a very small environment. So, but I really believe that uh, today you can't be expert of everything. So we, I want to have a team of uh, supermen. Uh, it's not anymore the time of uh, of the surgeon can operate from the brain to the, to the legs. You need to be super specialized. You need to be competitive against uh, a lot of different uh, uh, competitors. You know, not only cardiologists, you know, the competition is really broad. So, and you can be competitive only if your competition is based on competence, it's not skills, competence. Competence means you need to know everything about something. So if I, I know I'm not, uh, I'm not that competent in transplantation, I can do a transplantation, I can operate a transplantation, but I'm not the most expert on transplantation. I'm the best expert in mitral and tricuspid. But also, outside of that, you know, I, I, I have my limitations. So we need to understand that we cannot be multitasking. We should have one objective in life, and this objective should become a kind of a disease, a mental disease. You need to work on that day and night. Yeah, I, I think I would add it depends on what center you're in. If you're in a large center, then it makes sense. Uh, then surgeons will need a subspecialize. If you're in a small center, and there are many centers, in fact, most cardiac surgery in the United States are done at hospitals that do less than 200 open operations per year, uh, then you have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades, but you also have to know your limitations. You have to know when to refer a patient to a larger center when, when the patient's risk is high or when a, a repair is absolutely necessary or whatever it is. I quite agree. I think uh, sometimes it depends where we are. We may have to do everything we can. and. Uh, because of our culture, we don't like to send patients to other surgeons, but we have to move that. And uh, we have to send patients to centers where they do more than we do sometimes. It's, uh, it's, it's exactly back to what I've said. What's the opinion of the new generation, Rui? Um, 
it's it's um, I, I quite agree with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Professor Maizano. And uh, as someone uh, once said me in one of uh, my uh, my uh, research training that you can neither be a worm or a butterfly, and uh, and most of the times in our career, I think. We, we need to be prepared to be a worm, to eat all the plants, the, all the leaves in the same plant that we can find. And only after that, we can, we can think of being a butterf butterfly and, uh, and, and going and jump from flower to flower. And, and, and this, is, this is true, I think, for cardiac surgery. Special, I would say, from a, 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 a young, a young uh, or a, a, at an early stage of our career. We need to be worm, a worm then only then to become a butterfly. So that goes up to the beginning of our discussion where we discussed that uh, we should learn medicine and cardiology before becoming a cardiovascular surgeon or uh, it doesn't matter whether it's vascular or not. So the, uh, the, it repeats and um, as time is going by, I will ask uh, Philippe to end up this webinar. Before that, uh, I would like to thank you all for being here Francesco for being at half past midnight uh, your time over with us. Gora for being out of the, uh, the OR and coming over here. Rui for being a fellow and being able to be with us. And Professor Mura, which is a dear friend to be here with us. Thank you very much all of you. We enjoyed very much. And uh, my regards also to Rafa and to Tom who could not be here until the end. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rui. I would also like to thank you all to be here tonight. I could see from the list of people watching us that uh, there are many students here. So I know that many of them could learn a lot today and to feel your passion and uh, the way you see our future with bright eyes. It's, uh, it's amazing as a medical student and I know that, that I, that I wanna be a cardiac surgeon and you are all Good, great inspirations to me. So thank you all again. Um, I'd like to thank the Brazilian Society of Cardiovascular Surgery for this opportunity and hope that you all stay well in this troubled times. So thank you again and a good night. Bye, good night. Thank you. Bye, to, bye to all. Keep safe. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.